But I want to go back before that. Okay. I want to go back to, um, you know, you, you've always been in the arts. You're from Houston. Tell me about just your first inspiration as an artist. Wow, okay, let me see. First inspiration. Probably The Wiz, I always think about that. That's the first movie I remember seeing. And as a kid, I was just sort of obsessed with movies and obsessed with the blockbuster around the corner. And, you know, I was always trying to get my mom to leave me at the movie theater so I could like watch as many movies as I could. Um, but I didn't really know that that was a career. I just knew there was something in there for me. And um, it really wasn't until like I started looking at the credits and I started trying to decipher what these things meant, executive producer and director and what are these things? And I, I realized that like it was actually somebody's job to put, you know, decide what images to put and in what order and to who to show and to what they should say. I realized that, that was a job, you know, and, and the minute I realized that I, that's all I wanted to do. And thank God there was a magnet program or magnet programs in Houston uh, where I could sort of go to school outside of my neighborhood. And I ended up, uh, uh, auditioning for the high school for the performing and visual arts and I picked theater because in my naive brain that was close to film had never acted before in my life was so shy uh, and just kind of like somehow got in there and got my whole life that's really where it starts for me oh, it's so beautiful um, so after high school, you moved to LA. Moved to LA when? Went yeah. To college, so. Yeah. So I went to college uh, at Chapman University, uh, Orange County. Uh, I, I got a lot in, of white people. A lot of white people. <laughs> Woo! Um, and, and coming out of a magnet program in Houston, like I, you know, I was used to white people. I sort of I grew up in, in a black neighborhood, but I would get bused to these schools where you know predominantly white folks, and I had white friends, and you know white people didn't scare me. Um, <laughs> but it was a kind of white that was happening in Orange County that was certainly a culture shock for me, uh, and it, it certainly made sense to me then why they were giving me so much scholarship money to go there. <laughs> uh, but that was the one I could afford to go to. Uh, and it was a great film program. Um, you know, socially speaking, uh, y you get the movie Dear White People from my experiences there. So it, it, was, right. a, it was a mixed bag. They say, they say your wounds uh, oh, are yeah. your genius. So, um, okay. So let's talk about after school, your first jobs. What was your first job in Hollywood? Oh my God. Okay. So um, I got kind of lucky. I got kind of lucky. I was interning at Focus Features um, in the publicity department. And, you know, that sort of felt really far away from being a film director. But for whatever reason, even since high school, I sort of was interested in telling the story about the story. So we would do plays in high school, but it'd be my job to figure out, like, the posters. And, you know, we would have, like, you know, morning announcement commercials. I just, I, I enjoyed that. And, um, and I couldn't get a job, uh, I couldn't get an internship on a set, so, you know, I went for this PR thing that no, none of my other peers sort of were going for. And it was incredible, because um, I got to be at Focus Features around the time of, like, Brokeback Mountain. And I got to see, like, from the ground up how this black woman, Adrian Bowles, who, you know, ran their publicity department, how she literally broke these movies into these huge, like, phenomenons that, you know, these little things that they had plucked from Sundance, and these little tiny things that weren't supposed to be that big. Um, and by the time uh, college was ending for me, they were opening up Rogue, which was their sort of genre label for a time, and they needed an assistant. And I, I was interning there, and uh, for whatever reason, she saw something in me, and I was able to kind of get a job right away. It, 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 at the time, I was pissed, because I couldn't get a job on a set, and all my friends were working on sets. It, wasn't, it didn't feel like the, the, the right next step, but it was a job. So I moved to somebody's couch in LA, and that's what I did. And before that, you were publicity on my movie. Something yes, new. this is how we met. This actually, is how we met. <laughs> this so. is the this is me. My first job, uh, my first film that I worked on was something new as, as a, a paid employee. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> awesome. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Justin would accompany me to whatever you told me. Events to do, like these. Events like these. <laughs> <laughs> and he would carry my things because for some reason I was I had a lot of shit with me. I don't know why. Shit. You he had would cars. carry my things and he would say, and by the way, you know what I really am is a writer director and I've written a script and um would you read it? Um and I said yes. <laughs> I said yeah, yes. Yeah. It was kind of a mess. <laughs> 
But it was bold and it was interesting and there were all these different characters and I said, I remember saying, you know, keep working on it. Let mm -hmm. me know how it goes, right? Sure, yeah. And then, you know, separate lives happen. Um, that was in 2004. In 2012, my daughter runs with her computer to show me this amazingly funny Dear White People trailer. And I said, <laughs> oh, shit, I missed the boat. <laughs> he made it. I, I, was, I couldn't believe it. And I think I was here actually running the LA Film Festival at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you came up to me and said, hey, you know, I, believe, I think I tracked you down. No, I believe we accosted. It, we, like, Lena Waithe and I came to the LA Film Festival to find you, and we found you in an elevator. I believe you were on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, hey, have you seen the Dear White People trailer? Like, it was very aggressive. Uh, it was the kind of thing that I, I wouldn't be able to do on my own. <laughs> so I needed like a hype man like Lita to sort of push me to do that. Um, but it was great because the whole point of that trailer was like, wouldn't this be great if it was a movie? But we wanted, I wanted to make that trailer as close to what a real trailer would feel like so you'd be pissed at the end when it wasn't actually coming out. And it was like, no, we haven't made it. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out how to do that right now. And we got this trailer and it's going viral, but we don't know what to do with that. You so know? I said, where's the script? Yeah. And so then he gave me the script. It was much better. It was much clearer. You could see what the movie was. Um, and I said, I'm in. Actually, what I said was, I will help you, yeah. but only if I'm legit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he invited me in, and then we started going around town with our team, which was Lena Waithe and, and Angel. Uh-huh, and Angel Lopez. Lopez and, mm -hmm. and me, and we, we just started talking, and we almost made it at Focus. We, yeah, we almost made it at Focus. We almost made it at Sony. Yeah, we almost made it everywhere. Yeah, we, we, we like... Just typical, woo, right? I didn't know at the time, but now I do. But it was a pretty short time. It was maybe a year we sort of yeah. did our dance, and, and people were like, we will give you $250,000. Yeah, we like, what? It was rough, boobs. That was tough. That was tough. And then an angel appeared. Not that angel, another yeah. angel. Yeah, Julie, right? Julie. Yeah, Julie uh, Lebedev um, came in and financed that film and did so at a really, I would say, good price for her. You know, it, it was a, it's a low-budget film. We made that movie for pretty much a million dollars, maybe a little bit less. Wow. And um, But we didn't know that we could at first. I remember when we first started, we were trying to make it for more because like we didn't... Three or four. Yeah, or yeah. And, and eventually we were... Forced Corner. by circumstances <laughs> <laughs> to make it for much, much less. Exactly. Um, but Which I think was such a blessing. Actually, yeah, it was because you were so scrappy and you had what you had and you found that campus and and you know. Oh my God! Yes, we yeah, mm -hmm. we stole shots. You know, there were some shots from UCLA that eventually, when it was a series, they were like, "Hey, so can you pay us for that now?" And we had to go back and pay them. Oh, you did. Yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> And Shit was so, wild. next thing you know, it's Sundance. It's 2014. We're in the library. That's where the premiere was. We're in the library. The lights are going down. The movie comes up. The movie is, a, people are laughing from the beginning. They're enthralled. And then all of a sudden, the lights go on. That's right. The film cut off. I was the pissed. The lights go on. I'm sitting back with you, and we're looking at each other going, oh, my. This is the premiere at Sundance. Yeah. Place. Okay, this is a, I was thinking, oh my God, this is like a nightmare. It was kind of horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. I remember going, because I'm not like a screamer or anything, but like I was just so <laughs> wound up. I just remember like pacing in the hallway and talking to like an usher and being like, when's it coming back on? And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> I have absolutely nothing to do with that. It came on, it played, it played wildly successfully there. Uh, it took a while to sell. Yeah, it did. People remember it as like this out the box success, yeah. but we did. I, I was celebrating my birthday, which is in May, and we still hadn't sold it. It was sort of like uh, it was the New York Film Festival. I think we were doing uh, at the time when we finally got the news that we had we had secured a, a deal for it. Yeah. Um. So so I wanted to pause for a second and just talk about that film in terms of 
race and representation and what you were doing and it sort of set the tone for a lot of a lot of the the issues that you explore um but in this uh well it's satire isn't it yeah i think of it as satire um and and part of it, i mean it was a lot of things you know it was it's a story of two people. It's a story of a, of a bunch of kids, but really when it comes down to it, Sam and Lionel uh, really kind of move that movie forward. And as the movie starts, um, you know, Sam is this very vocal, very Afrocentric sort of voice on campus, but she's got this little secret. She's, she's, she's fucking this white dude, you know? And Lionel is, is trying to manage being black and gay in a, an environment where there aren't a lot of black people. And so he feels like he has to sort of like live up to, you know, one of the very limited roles that is allowed for black men. And uh, it's just kind of fighting his, his own truth in that way and figuring out how to be a man and how to lead. And, and they do this kind of dance uh, in that movie. And I didn't realize that's what I was doing at the time. Um, you know, people think of that movie as, as uh, it is race satire, it is social satire, but the things that these kids are talking about in that movie, these are the things that were on my mind, these are the things that were on my friends' minds, but that was what we were saying all the time. That's just what we would talk about. But what the movie's really about is, is these people trying to navigate, like, how do I figure out how to become myself when the world says I can only be this or that. And it really is, it's actually a much simpler story. It's a story about identity versus self and how you need one or the other sometimes and you need a mix of both. And people like us don't really have that free space to figure out, figure that out, you know? Um, and, um, and yeah, it worked, thank God. Cause I, I remember, I remember as Sunday as we were like, you know, Tell, tell them it's okay to laugh. Because <laughs> people were so, you know, dear white people, it was like the most offensive thing you could say. I mean, people would really freak out about it. Wearing swag at Sundance, we had yeah. the buttons and everything. People yeah. Would come up and go, what's that mean? Yeah, and people Why to this day, that? you know, it, it was really, uh, it was tense. We didn't know how people were going to receive it. Um, but I had this feeling that uh, there were more people like me in the world who needed content like this. And, and I was right. That's so true, <laughs> and um, and also I think it's worth saying that the way that you navigated that film by making the trailer first was really, um, it stemmed out of, like you were saying, in high school, where yeah. you wanted to create the show, like put the show on. That's and, right. And, and the PR work that you did. And, 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 I, and I learned it. And how important it. is social you know, media uh, uh, for, for a filmmaker? I mean, I, that sounds like a dumb question, I know, but I'm, I'm curious, can you I navigate think you, without it? Or? I think you can totally navigate without it. And at times it feels like a burden, to be honest. But it was, it's the thing, it was like, I, I really did say to myself one day, I, I have to make movies by hook or by crook, I'm going to use everything that I can. And I don't have contacts, I did not have family members, I did not have money, I didn't have those things. What did I have? I had a, a career in PR, <laughs> and I had access to Twitter, and those are the things that I used. Right, and it was really as simple as that. that it was a, um, a Twitter. Yeah, when thing. I was developing that script, um, yeah. I was doing Dear Asking, White. Wait, and well, how, like, give us an example of what you were saying on that. Oh, thing. so like you know, uh, oh God, I don't remember a good one, but it was the Dear White Peopleisms that yeah. you hear all through that movie. Right. Um, I, I, it was a Twitter account called Dear White People, and it was just like daily observations, you know. Uh, oh, I know one, one. When uh, yes, white people, we know you hike, and you. <laughs> Remember that? Somebody, Somebody yeah. Like that. That was funny. I was in LA. I was making fun of y'all. But I was also I was also testing to see how people would respond to this voice. And I realized, because the movie was called 2% at the time, and I changed it to Dear White People uh, because I realized that was probably the most sort of interesting thing that was happening, uh, most like marketable thing that was happening in that script was her radio show, Dear White People. And I, I wouldn't have found that out if I wasn't kind of testing out her jokes on Twitter. And so we had this sort of brand identity, you know, that we were able to build upon when that trailer came out and then eventually the movie came out and eventually the show came out. And, and did you, did you know there was a TV show in there? I did, yeah, I did. I ultimately, at first, I wanted to make like a big, sprawling, that mess version that you read is, you know, my attempt at making an Altman movie, which was a lot bigger than the one we actually made. Um, and so by the time it was pared down to the film that came out, there were so many things 
on the on the cutting room floor that I didn't get to say. And and the big thing for me was that was sort of like around the time where the Black Lives Matter movement was getting going. I felt like I didn't really get into the heart of political activism in that film. Political activism is sort of kind of happening over there a little bit, but I didn't really take that aspect of it seriously um, in that film. And I really wanted to get into that. And uh, through the course of the film, we were always, you know, touring colleges. You know, I, I, I think we both just celebrated getting our first paycheck from Dear White People like a week ago. So I had no coins. From the movie. I had no coins when this movie came out or when we sold it. I had no coins. I, I was paid $15,000 to produce it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. About. Yeah, I think I was a little bit under that. I don't know. But I, it was... It, but the way I made money is we would do these college tours and I would get paid to speak. And you had your book? I had the Dear White People Selling book. Selling the book? Mm -hmm. This is such entrepreneurship. This is hustle. This, yeah, is this is hustle. hustle. Because here's the thing. It was like the choice was to leave Sundance having sold your movie and then move back home to Houston. That was the choice. Or to figure out a way to make some money. Right. And um, what happened is touring the, the movie on college campuses, I kept gathering more and more stories. And so by the time I run into Tara Duncan uh, at Netflix, and she's like, hey, have you thought about doing a show? I'm like, actually, I have. And actually, here are what all the episodes might be. I'd really kind of worked it out. No, he came correct, because I remember when we had that first meeting, there was already a Bible, there yeah. was a, a, a sense of what the show was going to be, which very much turned out That's what we show. did, yeah. Except for when uh, somebody died. Lionel. I was trying to kill oh, Lionel. We were trying to kill Lionel. Yeah. Didn't kill Lionel. Well, because, okay, so ba the dream was to have the same cast just sort of continue into the show. And that was That's not. That's what we started trying to get yeah. Tessa. And... None of that ended up happening. But at the time, there was like this m sliver of possibility where we could get everybody except Tyler because Tyler was on contract for some other show. He was on some other show. And we could only get him for a few episodes. So I was like, okay, well, we'll just kill him. <laughs> That'll be dramatic. And then I think you and Yvette, Lee Bowser, and a few other people were like, you can't kill Lionel because he's you. You can't kill yourself from your show. And then like therapy revealed the whole thing about like internalized homophobia. I was like, oh my God, I can't. And so, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I, this was a real conversation I have with my therapist. Uh, and so we decided not to kill Lionel. Uh, God. Yeah. Um, and it actually, the, the episode that, that was supposed to happen, it ended up becoming about Reggie, and Barry Jenkins ended up directing that That's episode. Right. That's and that, right. that was like a kind of a watershed moment for the show. It was really when the series, and I know that they all come out at once, but <laughs> as people were watching it, that's the moment when you realize what the show really is. Yeah. And that the humor and all of this very sophisticated conversating and articulating that the characters are doing, that's the surface of the show. There's something else underneath it. So we did four seasons. Mm -hmm. That took over your life. Yeah, it was the past 10 years, basically. Wow. Um, how, how, on the other side of that, were you, how, how were you feeling? Like, did you feel like you had excised all of? No, I felt really low, actually. <laughs> it was tough. It was a tough, I think this industry is tough. Everyone says that, and you hear that, and you go, yeah, yeah, but it's not going to be me. And you kind of need that naivete, I think, to get going. But there's a heart of darkness. There's a uh, dark night of the soul moment, I think, that anybody and everybody that entered this industry has, especially when you have success. And um, 10 years in, four seasons, I would finally made a second movie around that time. I was really burnt out, and I really didn't understand like why living my dream was so fucking hard and awful, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and uh, I had a real sort of, you know, yeah, I had a real dark night of the soul moment during that time. Yeah. And that, that was bad hair? That's yeah, that was, yeah, bad hair. yeah, bad hair. Mm -hmm. Bad hair was like kind of like me trying to break out of the farm, you know? It's sort of like this system had built around me um, that was about productivity and it was about churning out episodes and it was about sort of like satisfying, you know, network and studio concerns and all these things that it just, it just happens. Like it just, it's very difficult to stop that from happening until it happens to you and you, you realize like, where you need to sort of like put your lieutenants and all that kind of stuff. Um, and bad hair was like, you know, it was, a, it was, it was literally like, you know, it, it was an escape. <laughs> it was like, I just want to do something completely different. And we had, in order to make bad hair happen, um, I had to, basically we were doing a writer's room downstairs of this building in, in downtown Los Angeles. 
and I would shoot the movie upstairs. So I'd be shooting bad hair, and I'd be checking in on my lunch breaks downstairs to see how the writing was going for season three. And it was crazy, but it was the only way to like sort of do something else, <laughs> you know what I mean? I sort of, um, you know, you talk about that hustle thing. The reason I hustle is because for every movie that I've made, for everything I've made, there are dozens of things that I haven't made, that I've tried to make, that I've been, you know, churning and trying to get off the ground. And when, when you get told no, I just, I go and figure out something else to do. And so what Dear White People became for me is it was this place where I could direct. And it was a place where I could hone my craft because it was just really difficult getting other things going. And um, when, you know, we got the money for bad hair, this is in the aftermath of Get Out. I wrote Bad Hair in like 2014 and just kind of sat around until all of a sudden the industry decided black people liked horror movies and you know, uh, it was like, okay, well you can make it now or never. <laughs> that's, that's what I did. That's what I did. And, and, and sold that too, right? Yeah, we sold, that one sold for a, a lot more money, <laughs> thank God, at Sundance. At Sundance? Yeah, okay. I, I, but I was miserable. Um. <laughs> Okay, so, and I also just, we're going to get into Haunted Mansion, but <clears throat> I wanted to just pause for a moment and just talk about, if you if you will, just the personal, your personal life. Like, yeah. how important is it to have somebody through these ups and downs? Oh, wow. I mean, for me, it was, it's, it was kind of paramount, you know, <laughs> pun not intended. Um, I met my husband, uh, we've been together for 10 years. We got married uh, in the middle of Haunted Mansion on our eighth anniversary. Um, we fought about Beyonce on our first date. And it's this like white boy from Atlanta. And I was like, fuck you. Like, you don't know Beyonce. And he was right. And uh, I forget, we were fighting over some lyric or something. And uh, we just kept fighting, you know? And uh, now we love each other. <laughs> And we have two cats. And, and, and the, he just showed me the picture from the Beyonce, the silver from the Beyonce. Oh, concert. we were fabulous. It's off the chart. Um, but, but I just mentioned that because I think a lot of times we get so caught up in making and achieving and being known. And there's, there's, it, we're all driven. You guys are all driven here. You know, you wouldn't be here if you weren't. And, and I just, I just think it's important to to realize that there's, there's what fuels you is interpersonal relationships. You know? Yeah, absol absolutely. Having a personal life, having a home, you know, building a family. And, and it's going to look different for everybody, you know. Uh, I'm not, like, advocating for certain kind of relationships or anything. But, like, for me, you know, I'm a Taurus and I'm a homebody. And so building out a home, you know, with my husband really is what has fed me and kept me together, um, you know, through the ups and downs of this industry. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so Haunted Mansion. So I told Justin this in the green room that the Haunted Mansion ride for me in high school was when I had my first makeout sessions. <laughs> uh, because it's dark and you got to pretend to be scared and next thing you know. Um, and, and I don't know if anybody has experienced that on the Haunted Mansion, but um, I really felt like you captured the, the, the essence of that place so well. You Thank know? you. Just really from the chairs going down. Like, there's just so much stuff I recognize. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Like, you're a Disney freak, right? A little bit, yeah. Like, a little bit. Like, I, I, um, my mom took me to the park, like, to Disney World when I was a little kid. It was like a big deal. We drove down to New Orleans and we flew to Orlando. It was a whole thing. I remember the first time I rode that ride. Um, I was a part of a show choir because I am a true homosexual from Houston, Texas. <laughs> and and uh, we would <laughs> sing, we would do these little competitions that would take us to Disney World. I mean, I was there all of the time as a kid. And when I went to college uh, at, in Orange, I actually got a job at Disneyland. So I too was on the Haunted Mansion ride, you know, every lunch break. Um, and, and I don't know, a lot of my movie memories involve a Disney film that kind of blew my mind as a How kid. How did that come to you? 
that movie? It was a script. It, it was a script. Um, I was sort of, uh, I was in the halls already working on uh, on a now, uh, <laughs> a project that I'm no longer involved with uh, in the Star Wars universe. And um, uh, we got the script and I really kind of got it not expecting much. And the script, to my surprise, it just really touched me. I thought it was so funny and I thought it was really heartfelt. It was about grief. Um, and I just started pitching this sort of black version of it. Uh, and they kept like letting me go forward. <laughs> I really didn't expect to get it, to be honest with you. Uh, I kind of said everything that I didn't think they would want to hear. I was like, I want a black lead and I want practical effects and I want that, you know. And they kept saying yes. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm in Atlanta for like 150 days shooting on Imagine. So what was that experience like? I mean, going from a million dollar movie, I don't know how much bad hair costs, but, you know, low budget world with a lot of autonomy mm. into the belly of the beast. It was a mind fuck. It was a mind fuck. Um, but... I don't mean, like, it didn't destroy me. It didn't, like, you know, I, there was a lot of stories about directors moving from the independent world to the studio world and going absolutely batshit crazy. And I would always read these stories and be like, huh, come on. This is your big opportunity. Like, how could this happen? I absolutely understand how it can happen, <laughs> okay? Like, I, I, one billion, I get it. I totally get it. And it didn't do that to me, and I'm very, very proud of that. Um, but it was like something, it was like, a, it was like a, a peak I needed to see. Like, I needed to see how those movies are made. And it was so fun working on such a big canvas and working with these wonderful actors who really, so really many great love actors. what they I mean, do. Just popping up. Oh you know, my God, so that, that was the best part. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a beast. It is a beast. Uh, it is a beast. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it is. Okay. Try not to get fired, y'all, you know? <laughs> It comes out on DVD this month. I got I got to still keep the campaign Look, it's going. It's super fun. It is fun. <laughs> it's funny. It is very touching. Yeah. It, it's amazing that you were able to sort of straddle all of that. And the visual effects are big and, and wild. And it's black. It's so know? black, yeah. Which is so amazing because we do not see ourselves in these spaces. I thought there was something really fun and subversive about putting somebody, putting a movie out there that's really about grief and helping kids in particular overcome grief and move through grief in the form of somebody like Lakeith Stanfield. I just thought there was, I just was really enamored with that idea of putting a movie like this in the world with that guy, you know, um, and I'm really proud of that. Yeah. Oh, he's great. And and but there's so many there's so many great performances in that movie. Thank you. Owen Wilson. The yeah, best. The best. The cast was the best. It yeah. really was. Um uh but the you talk about autonomy. Um you definitely lose a lot of that. <laughs> and I I sort of like I'm not a you know me, I'm not a dictator. So I've never really like held on to my autonomy in that way and sort of like so to me it was like, oh great, collabor I love collaboration. That's wonderful. But I will say the process made me appreciate a certain degree of autonomy that I didn't even know how much I needed and valued it until it was absolutely gone. <laughs> and you know, um it certainly clarified for me a lot about me as a filmmaker and the kinds of things I, I need to do moving forward. But so that's, a, you know, that's the, the big shebang. Would you do it again? Maybe. <laughs> you see. Maybe. Maybe if I had you up in there, you know, yes. holding. Well, producers are important. Holding right? the door closed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, what's great is you've done film, you've done TV, big. Disney movie, tiny little movie, and your podcast. I just want to talk about the podcast. Yeah, yeah, the podcast. I mean, look, I, I'm, I, I don't sit still well. <laughs> I really don't. And um, when the doors are closed and the things I've written aren't going and I, I can't, um, I don't do well with that, you know? And the podcast came out of, one, me genuinely wanting, because I'm also an introvert, so when I'm not working, I'm like, where are my friends? <laughs> I forgot to cultivate my friendships. So um, the podcast was part like hanging out with people that I love and, and really having real conversations and was about. was that over the pandemic, the podcast? Uh, oh, gosh, yeah. It started before that. It started because KCRW 
was at, at that time uh, was looking for new podcasts, and um, and we got in the door that way, and we kept it going uh, for for a couple seasons. Um, but yeah, it was it was sort of a way to talk to, talk to my favorite people uh, about how their industry experience was going. It was like these are conversations that I actually really needed. We just happened to record them and put them out okay, in the world. Still available. Oh yeah, don't at me. You can find it. So before we wrap up, I wanted to talk about being an artist singularly on your own, doing what you want to do, and in the process of success, all of a sudden you're a boss. Yeah. What is that like? It's hard. It's hard because it's actually the majority of what I do. Um, and I didn't really expect that. I didn't know that that's how so it was going to be. You, when did you, I know you formed your, you had your company, but when, you know, people have a, a company, right, mm -hmm. a name, production company but then the difference is when you have employees in that company. yeah 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 so talk about that a little. well I always had an assistant you know and at a certain point I had uh, I started to have some really great assistants who would were growing into more than just that and when around the time Haunted Mansion was going I decided that my then assistant was ready to not only be a coordinator but actually be a creative exec and then I brought on another assistant and I brought on somebody to handle social media it was very organic and it was more like there's just more work here than we can do so who else can help us. It was extremely organic. And by the time we come back from uh, Haunted Mansion, you know, I've got three employees and now a, a president running the company uh, with me. And um, uh, yeah, that then becomes your job, you know. And certainly when the strike hit, uh, you know, we like a lot of folks lost our, our overall deal was suspended. And so all of a sudden I've got this office lease that I never would have taken on if I wasn't in an overall deal to pay. And I've got salaries to pay and I've got health insurance to pay. And it's, uh, it's just a whole other, th yeah, it's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Meanwhile, the strike is happening, and there's, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a big difference between how certain directors uh, were received by the public promoting their films and how others were. Uh, it, was, it was a tough summer, I'm not yeah. going to lie. It was. Yeah. It was a really tough summer. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it's important because you really can't make movies in a bubble. You really can't. And to create like my own foundation from the ground up with people who know how I work, um, has actually proven to be really, really important uh, in terms of the kind of projects I can set up um, and how quickly I can get things going and how protected I can be while those things are going. So it's super worthwhile, but it is a whole other job. It's a whole other job. It's, it's part of the hustle. Yeah, it is. Um, but, and and so, so moving forward, so, oh God, we're finally, the other strike is done. Now we gotta get this <laughs> other one. <laughs> Um, and that's only three years guarantee. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna be here. But again. us live through it. Mm hmm and we, Yeah, we lived through the last one, we're living through this one and we do. Um do you do you have any I mean this has been helpful. Has this been helpful, you guys? Yeah. Um but I always like to leave these events with um just a little personal, you know, what can you I mean you've been through so much and you know, they say, what doesn't kill us. Makes you stronger. That's right. That's Do right. it. Yeah. Um, I actually, you know, the industry is really shit right now. Let's not fool ourselves. However, at the same time, I can feel the shift. I can feel another. Sh it feels very 2013 to me. The audiences are hungry for something else. And even though the industry doesn't quite know how to provide that yet, I, I do. Artists do. Artists always know instinctively like what the people are kind of needing and wanting. And so I feel kind of excited because um, I feel like it's a really good time to get personal again with my work. And it's a really good time to um, sort of bring something new uh, out into the world. And I feel like the world is maybe ready for that. Um, I feel like people are just getting bored with the old formulas, you know? So that's exciting, it's always exciting because we have this opportunity to kind of remake the industry again. But it is, it's always tough. There's always a little blood, you know, when you got to break ground. So, um, but I think, I don't know, I think, I think the shift is here. I think people, the thing what that I- Marvel, I mean, how many, how many? Uh, yeah, right. Multiverses do we need? You know, I don't, I'm good. Like multiverses are like an average, like boring, it's old now. <laughs> um, but no, and this is really exciting. And this has happened before. Mm -hmm. You know, if you study in the early '70s when people oh, yeah. were just like taking matters into their own hands, now it's 
it's so much easier because you can make a movie on your cell phone. Yes. Steven, Steven Soderbergh does. That's all right. All the time. TikTok okay. is, I think TikTok is really exciting. It's addictive and it's all crazy. It's all the bad things people say about it. But it's also really interesting because you have a, a generation of people growing up with extreme cinema savvy. Like they really understand how to use cinema. So true. And, and they're not afraid to. They're not and afraid, they're not to, afraid use to fail, it. which nope. is what keeps a lot of people from just making that short. You know what I'm yes, saying? Right, yeah. Somebody's got to look at it, and then somebody's got to say something about it, and and it's easier not to do it, to be honest. And the gap between like, how do I go viral on TikTok to how do I get a movie in theaters? That gap is where all the trouble starts because you start to believe that they know something that you don't know. And so much of the hustle, so much of the pain points of my career so far are about sort of really believing that they know something that I don't know, but they don't. They they really don't. The diff they the don't. the gap is effort. The gap is effort, trial and error, That's right. learning, it's like just stepping one step. Ahead, just doing it. Just step out into it. Not being trust. afraid to fall on your face. That's right. In front of lots do. of people. That's right. That's right. In a cape at Disneyland. <laughs> um, don't be afraid of that because otherwise you're you're never gonna make it. It's like it's. You have to have those moments, you know. Unfortunately, all of us are not going to, we don't get to be sort of, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson right out the gate. Like, you got to start from where you're at and, and get there. Amen. Yeah. Justin Simeon, you guys.